God bless you. Uh, today we are going to try to dive into the lesson. Uh, this lesson uh, is right on time. And I'm going to tell you what this lesson is about, being empowered by the spirit. And that's why we place a lot of emphasis on you making sure that you have received the power of the Holy Ghost. If you're out there flailing and, and, and the way you believe it ain't working, maybe we need to go back into the word and see what the word has to say about the power and of the Holy Ghost, of the power by the spirit. You cannot have power without the spirit. Now, we have put a lot of emphasis and we do need to speak in tongues, but we also need to show fruit. So this lesson is very timely and good because we're living in a day and time where people are really suffering. And if you can't get out of yourself, you know, sometimes I talk to some people and they still don't get it. That's when I know they're blind. You got to ask God, look, God, stop begging God and praying, Lord, open my eyes. I, I, when, when we say open the eyes of the blind, uh, that could mean some of us, some of you. Because you can be blinded to the things or the experiences or the signs that being empowered by the Holy Ghost will bring you. Uh, so I love this lesson. And so we're going to get right into it. And we're asking your prayers this morning because we really want to try to cover as much ground as we can. I'm thanking God for his healing power. I can, I can feel his power within me the way God is healing healing. Isn't that something? Healing. I, I want God to uh, uh, just carry us through. And if you want to put something in the chat, you can, because I'm going to try to go straight through this lesson this morning uh, so we can get uh, this. This is what we need. I have, um, I would say in the past couple of months and weeks have touched on some of these things. And look, God already knew what would be written, what would be written. And if you felt, well, I'm tired and, and, and uh, we're hearing the same thing and I want to hear something else. God, don't move on until you're ready to move on because he loves us enough for us to know the signs and the things that we should be doing if we are allowing the spirit to empower us. Now, uh, the spirit is empowering, but it doesn't go to unwilling vessels, vessels that don't want to receive, vessels that don't want to follow through, vessels that don't want to do uh, what's been instructed for them to do. Because the power is not given to you to enjoy yourself, but the power is given unto you to go among people that need help, need deliverance and salvation. Uh, our, our text is taken from the truth about God is God empowers his people, his people. I like to put an emphasis on that. Everybody that goes to church, everybody that proclaims to be a Christian are not his people. All right. So this is going to show you he empowers his people. Right. And that's a possessive pronoun. His, you belong to. You are his. All right. Uh, now, uh, um, I, I'm going to go down to the next before I really get into all the uh, explanation, but let's look about the truth about my life. Everybody said the truth about my life. Can you say that even though I can't hear you say that? Say it again, the truth about for my life. All right, don't worry about me, don't worry about others, but what is the truth for your life? Here is what uh, it emphasizes in the explanation in the sentence below. It says, I will seek now, that means that you are praying and you want to. It ain't like somebody got to tell you, oh, I do it because you call me, but I don't feel like doing it. No, that's not the fruit. That's not what happened. It says, I'm going to seek to be. And seeking to be means you all know you're not in the word. You know you're not studying. You know you're not meditating. You're doing everything else. And you have allowed the devil to occupy and fill your mind with worldly cares worldly worries, worldly ambition, their uh, worldly uh, needs, uh, not spiritual, but worldly. You know, we think about all these things, but when you seek to be empowered by the spirit, it means that I'm seeking whatever I'm reading in this word, I know God can demonstrate it through me. And that's the mentality that you have to establish. You don't sit there and be an all, ooh, 
they, they lay hands on the sick. Oh, from afar, you may see people, God using other people, ordinary people to do these things. And you're saying, I would like to do that. The only thing that's keeping you from performing or operating in those gifts is you. When you say seek, you know, and a lot of times we talk about the spirit seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. Huh? Do you, do you want to be empowered? Not standing in front of everybody else. This is a private conversation. This is a private conversation between you and God. When was the last time you had that private conversation where you have that hunger and need for God to use you while you're breathing, while he has a chance to go out and reach people. When we talk about discipleship, when we talk about going out and reach people, you're going to need all the things that you read in the Bible to be operating in you. Uh, Overseer Hicks is not going to be there. Uh, we can call all the bishops in the world. God is depending on you because you're the one that God has placed in an area to go out and reach those people. And you just don't stick with a few people. If you only got three people, <laughs> uh, uh, you're not doing it. You understand what I mean? And what I mean, I don't mean I don't know them, but you're really giving them the word. Not just always business, but God through you will speak to their hearts and you get outside your comfort zone of the people you know, your family, all that. Still talk to your family, but you got to get out of that. How many people, new people have you sought to reach? Those of you that are on Facebook, how many people have you sought to read and hope that you can reach them where they're being inquisitive? I have actually received things on my messenger uh, where people wanted to talk to me. That's the impact that you should be having. If you're on Facebook or you're doing other things that you're not having that impact, then uh, you are not showing to the people that you have been empowered by the spirit. This lesson today will show us about and teach us about empowerment. Number one, I'm going to ask you a question, and you may not answer, but this, how do you get that power? It says what? You want to seek after it. You want to desire it. You want to, to, you have a hunger for it so that you can work not in partial, but full capacity of what the spirit, whatever the spirit did with those in the Bible, he can do it through you. Don't, don't, don't let the enemy steal that thought from you because we are empowered by the spirit. Let's talk about witnessing. You know, when you go out to witness to people, uh, there are a lot of uh, things that, that you may be faced with. So while you're talking to people, uh, uh, there's a need for the uh, spirit of discernment. Sometimes there's a need. So that would uh, tell you exactly what the people need. And, and then you can do it by his supernatural power, hit on the things that they need without them telling you. You see, because uh, uh, sometimes you may be way off, but you're not going to be off. People won't admit you're on target. But yet the power of God knows minds. He knows them. We talk about minds and hearts, same thing, because the mind of the spirit is the heart. And that's the part that God operates through for our changes, like being delivered, uh, re being receptive, all those things are empowered by our thinking. And that's why the Bible tells us to be transformed. Transformation uh, happens when your mind has been renewed. Your thoughts are different. The way you feel is different. And even though you may, you may uh, uh, go the wrong way, God will tell you, no, go back and fix that. You need to do it that way. So we need the guidance of the Holy Ghost. All right. So uh, you want to rely on God to enable you to be his witness. In what ways? A lot of ways. So let's get, let's, let's cut down to the uh, lesson. I would like to uh, uh, read uh, from uh, Acts 1 and 8, which is one of the scriptures that you should know by heart from our previous Bible discussions and lessons. Uh, we focus on Acts 1 and 8. And this is something that should be in your memory, we quote this all the time. And listen to what it says, even though we're reading, uh, let's, let's, let's really, I want you to say, God, open my eyes. Lord, I want to see. I don't want to just be here hearing words. This time, when, when, when you're allowing the word to come in and have impact, you can't shake it. It kind of convicts you. 
and it follows you outside this space. Some of you hear it when we're here in this space, but what about once we leave this particular space? What impact is God's word having on you? All right, so in order for you to change from what you've been doing, your mind has to be renewed. It said, but ye shall receive what? Power. And they're going to put it up. You shall receive what? Power. When? Not before. We have so many people coming into the church feeling empowered. I've been in church a long time, but did you really receive the Holy Ghost? We don't have time to go back over the day, but remember in previous lessons, there's a sign. And if anybody said you don't have to speak in tongue, they didn't read the scripture. That's a sign. And not that you've been taught, not that you practice it, but when the power of God hits you, it will hit you so suddenly. The way I received the Holy Ghost was I was praying and, and, and I thought I wouldn't get it because I wasn't going to fake it. I said, God, if it's real, I want to be filled like the Bible says. And all of a sudden, the next thing I know, it looked like I was uh, translated. I was here, but not here. It, it, it's the most beautiful experience that I have ever experienced in my life. And before I know it, there was a sound coming out of my lip and a language. I didn't, I didn't speak like everybody else. A lot of people speaking the same thing, but God will change your language at different times uh, so that you will know that this power is coming from on high. That's a sign. As chapter 10, the believers that got the Holy Ghost first knew the other people in chapter 10 got in their Cornelius' house because they heard them speaking in tongues like they did. They heard, for they heard them speak with tongues. So uh, let me go on. So then it said, it said, so you shall, ye shall receive power after. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can't have power. And that's a false narrative that's going throughout the uh, uh, so-called, quote unquote, Christian world or, or among some believers that they do have the Holy Ghost and you don't need that. But that's a whole nother uh, lesson. Now, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses, you can't witness to nothing you haven't experienced. And every experience that you have is a witness. Every personal experience you have with God, you can witness uh, to others about how God has operated in your life. And not only through verbal, verbal, but also action. Seeing God perform things that is not humanly possible to be performed without him, okay? And then I, I want God to use me in a way where uh, 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 you're going to witness to God with your life, your actions, you see, which is, is, is different. That The power of God demonstrating that it didn't stop in the Bible, but God's power and spirit continues to deliver. He said, and not just where it starts, not just in Jerusalem. Some of y'all still stuck in Jerusalem. Even though you got the Holy Ghost, you're stuck because you haven't went to all of Judea. That may go outside your circle of familiars. You, you got people that uh, you know, you got people that you talked to for years, and you can't understand that sometimes you got to let them go and go to others that were here. So you're not making progress if you're not pulling new people in. You know, sometimes I would go in the store and my, and my, and my children will look at me, but that's a possible soul. And sometimes I might can give them a message that will make them think. And we never know what our, the impact of, a, of the word or the gifts operating in us has made in people's lives. But yet that's your uh, opportunity to reach outside where you were when you came. You got to go to all of Judea. Then you got to go to Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. Your surrounding, your, 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 your place and your space where God has placed you. It shouldn't stop just right there in your neighborhood if you're in Waukegan or if you're in Beach Park or if you're in somewhere, if you're in Chicago, if you're in it should spread throughout. And media is a good place to uh, start doing that. But uh, but when we just do other people quote, but we have emptiness in what we are conveying to other people, God will show signs in your ministry and wonders by what you do. Acts uh, 
one, one and eight is one of our scriptures that I just read. Uh, Acts 4 and 29, we will be dealing with that through 31. So while we're, we're there, we can go to ask, uh, get ready. But before we do that, I want to uh, uh, read the Bible overview. As is common in many New Testament writings, early passages within the book of Acts provide motives, motives that resonate and repeat throughout the book. Acts 180 essentially serves as this thesis statement that frames the entirety of Acts and gives an important preview of what is to come, what is to come. Several key phrases uh, give them them thematic structure for the entire rest of the book of Acts. And here are the words, power, holy ghost, witnesses, and uttermost parts of the earth. You know, that's like being on the scene and something happened. You try to say, well, I, well this happened, that happened. The first thing that the, the, the officers were asked you were, well, what did you see? Not what you heard, because a lot of people are operating off what they heard from somebody else, what they heard, what they, you know, heard. I mean, it's not a personal thing. I open up for them. That power and the word power is a repeated phrase and theme throughout Acts. And you will see it through the whole book of Acts. As you read the book of Acts from chapter one on to the end, you will see this repeated. You're going to see miracles of healing, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, mass evangelism, and many other undeniable signs and wonders are the hallmarks of Acts. All powerful events, these only happen through the outpouring and infilling of the Holy Ghost, the driving force of the entire book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is promised in Acts 1, poured out in Acts 2, then demonstrated for the rest of Acts. Witnesses is also a key phrase. Acts focuses heavily on evangelism, every teaching, preaching, and miracle ultimately tied somehow to evangelism. So are you doing that? Are you teaching? Uh, that's what evangelism is. Uh, some people are preachers. Uh, it, it goes on and on. Are you doing all these things, going all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? Even the business meeting, that's, that's very important. Even in the business meeting of Acts. Uh, uh, let, let's see, Acts 6, 11 and 15 focus on and result in how the church could better organize and focus with the purpose of reaching the world with the gospel. I wish I had time to read that. We're going to touch on some of that though, because that's important. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me go to one. Let's go to Acts chapter six and let's see if we pull a scripture out there to give you an illustration of what this is talking about. Now, remember, I always deviate from the book. Sometimes I'm led to do that so that you can get hopefully more clarity on what we are discussing. Acts chapter six, let's see what that's all about. And then we'll uh, 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 go on through our lesson. But the one thing I want you to know, all right, we got chapter six, here we go. It said, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a, murmur a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily administration. You notice that our church, that's why we do outreach. That's why this was already established in the Bible. Churches that don't do that, they're not following the instruction of Acts. There are people that have needs. You've got widows, you've got people that are poor, you got single parents, you got uh, people that are in poverty. Uh, whatever the need is, the church was instructed here. Then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples, your disciples, right, unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word, see, of God and serve table. When your pastor have to leave the word of God, go out, tire his or herself out doing what you're supposed to be doing, then that means you're being negligent of your duties. Because it's not meant for us to do that. You know what I mean? You're supposed to go out and do it. But those that are bringing the word, uh, uh, right here, here's the instruction right here. 
There were lots of people, disciples, but what were they doing? Why did 12 people have to call a multitude of followers, which were disciples, and tell them it's not reason, this don't make no sense that we got to, we can't study the word, we can't deal with what we're supposed to do, because we got to go out there and, 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 and tend to the need of the people. Somebody got to get a word and somebody got to do something else. Wherefore, brother, look ye out among you seven men of honest. Now, everybody that are followers don't have these reports. You don't want to be named among them. I know, I know that you may have been looking for something else, but I said, yes, Lord, let bring it on, Jesus. Because you could tell people all you want to, and they look at you blank, like they still don't understand what you're saying. I'm not supposed to have to be out in the trenches like I have to do, or uh, other pastors like myself have to do. That means somebody's being negligent. Somebody is being uh, negligent of their duties in the kingdom to, to, to do their part. And instead of you trying to be the pastor, or instead of you trying to be in a place you haven't been called, you need to work where you are. Because there's a lack and there's a, a, a opening, uh, I will say, for people to disciple. And that's a part of discipleship when you take food to the hungry, when you uh, go and check on households and people that may not be able to do things for themselves. Uh, now watch it, watch this. But he wanted them full of the Holy Ghost. You know why? Because if you appoint people that are not really full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, they're not going to work. So I need everybody to check yourselves and listen to my voice now. Are you really working and doing what you're supposed to do? Uh, 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 pastors and leaders, they'd be feeling bad too. Some of them came hardly walk too. Some of them have experienced pain too. Some of them have a lot of issues too. But yet the gospel has to be uh, uh, spread it and not just through just the preaching. We may do that but by the body coming together to fulfill the needs of people that have needs. It shows that God cares. It shows that this body loved despite Jesus fed people, not because they belong to his congregation. He fed them because he had compassion on the things they were experiencing. He looked out on the crowd, knew they was hungry, and he had compassion. And there are a lot of other things in people like that you need to look out over and see and have compassion. If you don't let, do that, you're lacking. You're lacking the spirit. You're lacking the move of the spirit. You know that uh, you got to go clean. You want to go clean. You want to go help. You want to do whatever you can. If we got to beg you to do it, you don't have that burden. If somebody, this should be something that happens to you whether anybody says anything or not. And then I'm going to repeat it again. Get outside your family and friends. There are people that you may not know, never grew up with, but they have a need. And you know that helps to build a kingdom. It said, but we will give ourselves. Now watch this. We want seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost. Because if they're not full of the Holy Ghost, they're going to cause chaos. And wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. We want them to do this. Do this. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer. So when a leader has to do something, they can't continue to get themselves to prayer because they're busy doing and running and doing other things and running. All right? And that's why we have auxiliaries. That's why we have heads of auxiliaries. And because this is scripture. This is scripture, right? So we can pray more, give you more word, and the saying please the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of what? Faith and of the Holy Ghost, because you gotta be filled with the Holy Ghost. So you can't just grab people off the streets and have them lead stuff. And a lot of churches do that too, because they, they can't obtain the wisdom that they need and not be filled. All of the prerequisite for all of this is being full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, Sometimes people can speak in tongues and still not be as full as they should be. They still haven't overcome themselves. They still haven't allowed themselves to completely, continually be filled. Uh, with the Holy Ghost. And he had to be full of faith and Holy Ghost. And they had Philip and Procurus and Nicano or uh, Taman and Parmen uh, Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set 
before the apostles, put them out, and when they had prayed. So when I lay your, my hands on you and I do, you see me doing this, that scripture. See, some of y'all didn't know that. So I tell all of y'all, line up now. Let me let me anoint you with oil and let me hand my lay my hands on you. But here's the fruit of whether people do it or not. And the word of God increased, and the number of what disciples did what multiply. Are we multiplying? What well, that mean if, if we're not continually bringing new people in, if we're excited about the gospel, then we should also uh, multiply and continue to multiply. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Those that were outside the faith were obedient. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And that's the promise. That's the promise of getting, of getting the power because you better do wonders, signs, miracles among all people. We may not see it, but God will display this in your ministry. As we go back into it, that's why I want to touch on some of this. Now, listen, when I started out and God sent me out, I didn't have a whole group of people going out with me. But when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, it didn't take a whole year for God to start dealing with me because I was praying and seeking to do God's will. When the last time you did that? So God, in spite of my body, in spite of the trials I'm going through, uh, I must work. And I know you need willing vessels. You need people that are full of the empowerment of your spirit to go out and work. The Bible said the harvest is ripe, but the labors are for few. You can't blame the pandemic because the pandemic had nothing to do with that. Because even in the Old Testament, when they were in a state of being enslaved by unbelieving nations, somehow they were still reaching people, even sometimes the leaders, like uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and all those, even though they weren't in it, but they had the knowledge that they served a God more powerful than they did because God would always demonstrate it with his people. He needs us to be the one to demonstrate to the other people that God is all powerful and it hasn't stopped. A lot of people are becoming disenchanted. They're, they're becoming uh, 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 doubtful of what Christianity is all about because it's, it's the quote unquote quote, church's fault because you're not doing anything. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do this the way God want me to do this this morning. All right, now let's go because I know a lot of people don't study, but let me do it for you. Let's go uh, to Acts. Chapter 4, 29 through 31. But I have some more scriptures here. Let me see. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm going so fast. Uh, so, yeah, I think I want to do that. Let's see what happened in Acts uh, chapter 4, 29 through 31. Let's read that. God is a good God. Uh, I know your lesson. Now, here's something, too. And after that, we're going to do Exodus. Ex, uh, did I just do Acts 3? No, I didn't. 3, 1, 2, 10, and Romans 8, 12, and 17. We're going to follow the format that's in, in, in your Bible. Right now, we're in Acts chapter 3. And we're starting at verse 1, right? Where are we at? Okay. Next oh, you're 29. Four and 29. You're right. You're right. Uh, Acts 4 and 29. Okay, let's read that. Now, let's see what's happening in Acts 4 and 29. Uh, it said, and now, Lord, behold their threatening. Let's go up above that and see what they were being persecuted for. Because a lot of people fall out because they get upset about the te teaching the name of Jesus. All right. Uh, let's go up. Let's try verse 20. I think it goes up. Let's see. And I'll tell you. All right. Keep going. And they lift up the what? All right. Now, when. All right, let me let me start at verse twenty. Let's see. Let's let's see, let's see what nineteen said. 
Because this is a long thing. All right, keep going. Go back up. I'll tell you when it's uh, 18. It's, there it is. 18, 19, uh, 17. Now, these were, I can't do the whole chapter, but I would invite you to read this uh, 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 chapter. But those that dwell in Jerusalem were upset because a man that had been coming around now all this time, nothing life-changing had happened. Uh, uh, guess what? Let me see. I think, let's go to 16. The Lord will lead me to go ahead. Don't worry about it. If I don't get to nothing else, keep going. Keep going. Uh, now, when they, uh, uh, let's, let's start at 13. I think that'll be enough. Now, when the bystanders, look at what it said. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned, that goes to all the people that condemn people that don't have college degrees. And I don't care if you get mad with me or not, because I'm not preaching for you, I'm preaching for him. Because a lot of learning has made some of you mad. And I'm not against learning because I did too. And, and a lot of us in my church have been to college, but it, that has nothing to do with it. But you getting a doctorate and a, a whatever else you want to get, still you can be blind to truth, even though you studied all these different ways of preaching and all that. Yet, look at what it says here. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant, that was their perception. Don't you feel ashamed of yourself when you make pastors and ministers and people that God is operating through feel low because they don't have your degrees? The Bible does not support that theory at all, because he said when they saw the boldness, they were educated. They knew everything about the scripture, but was still blind. You can go to all the seminary schools you want to go to, all the places you want to go to, and still don't understand the word of God. See, you may know all the eloquent words that go with it. You can speak uh, way better. You know, they, 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 they probably consider me rude in speech. I don't know, but I don't care as long as I can preach the gospel. But they call them it that they marveled. They were surprised. Now, wait a minute. What's going on? God is dealing with people that are unlearned and ignorant. The Bible lets you know that. They weren't educated like the Pharisees and the scribe. They went to uh, a school practice all their life and studied. And they had to take knowledge of them. They had to recognize that they had been with Jesus. How they know? Because when you connect with Jesus, and we're talking about led by the spirit and empowerment. God's going to display something within your life that goes beyond their knowledge, goes beyond what they feel should happen and take them straight into the real operating operation and power of God. And beholding a man which was healed standing with him. The man was standing with him now. They couldn't say nothing against that, but they were still preaching against uh, using the name of Jesus as you read it. You have to read this yourself. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. And that's what people do. So they'll get behind your back and talk and talk. They can't deny that God used you to do certain things, but yet they'll get behind your back and conspire. Why? Because it's messing with their reputation. They want to be looked upon as the great one, but yet they don't have the power or not being led and being empowered by the spirit of the Holy Ghost, being empowered, being uh, led by the spirit, okay? And it says this, now, uh, they said, but when they commanded them, verse 15, to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle has been done by them is manifest to all of them that dwell in Jerusalem. They were worried about what the people were going to see. They were worrying about the spotlight being taken off of them. And then they said, now we have denied everything else. We have countered everything they've done, but we can't deny this one. Because this one, God chose somebody that had been this way 
and been coming by their church sitting. People were coming around begging and doing whatever else. And now we see something different here. This man has been healed. It, it is a miracle. But they didn't want that news to spread. And so people will kill churches that are in power or, or ministries or ministers that have been empowered to do that. And they won't even let you come to their church or nothing. You will be the most unpopular preacher just because you're not chosen to, to speak big conventions and, and to speak their, their, their little gatherings they have together doesn't take away from the power that God has given you. I'm here to talk to and teach others that may be going through, but God has certain people that he wants you to go to to, 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 to deliver. Now look at this, cause Jesus had to do it. You see what I mean? His disciples had to do it. They had to meet the man outside the gate. They had to do it. You know, somebody been sitting out, beggars was there the whole time, but they had to do it, all right? Because God wanted to start there to show that miracles can happen. And it goes beyond just you learning scriptures and talking about scripture, but also understanding and receiving. Just like the Bible said, you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, all right? And here is the thing that I want to bring out in verse 17. I wish I had time, but that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth no more, uh, uh, speak to no man in this name. Now watch this. You will find that because they call us Jesus' name only people, and you will see us constantly pushing Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. I know that some of you have heard them say that about apostolic. And then they say, oh, God didn't name apostolic, whatever you want to name. Church, well, I don't care what your church name, church on the rock, whatever it is, it still has to acknowledge the name. Why? And they called them. Now they told him. Now they threatened that they speak his us to no man in his name. We're going to tell them, you can do whatever you want to do, but don't use the name of Jesus. That's what they were saying right here. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor even teach in the name of Jesus. That's the whole essence of what salvation is all about. What happened? See, when you don't study and you can't come and bring scripture to people, you need to go pray and tell God, I need to be deep and deeper in the word because I'm just in name only. I, I have no effect on the outsiders. I have no effect on those that are in error because you know what? When you are walking in the power of God, right? When you are led by the spirit of God, God will lead you to places to cause controversy. And so people say, everywhere they go, they just stop trouble. Why don't you just go and preach? No, I'm not here to just preach to mine. I want to preach to yours too if they listen. If they're not in the truth, if they're in my space, and when you come in my space, you're going to get the same thing just like Jesus did. He did not change his message to appease unbelievers. And people in the churches today are doing it. They are fellowshipping more with Dealing more with people that don't even believe in Jesus' name like that. Titles. That's it. Not the name of Jesus. Not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. They're not names. Those are titles. I, 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 I taught uh, on this before. And the Bible tells you what each of them represented. In the book of 1 John chapter 5, you can read that. So we don't want to teach nothing. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, will it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you? We, we can't do you what? Is this right? Will it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God? Then judge you. Hey, deal with yourself. Deal with yourself. You know, uh, because you get mad about it, because you don't agree with it, don't mean I'm going to stop doing it. Am I right? When I get wrong, raise your hand and I give you a chance to speak. I, I promise you I won't bash you or nothing. Because maybe you know more than I do. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Who did he minister to in Acts chapter uh, 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 1? Uh, uh, who did he talk to uh, instructing them in the ways of righteousness? You go to Acts. Who had already received instruction from God? Who was the one he told to go? Who did he talk to and say, go ye therefore? In the book of Luke, who was he talking to? See, those are the things 
the proofs that we have in the word that they were empowered and knew what they were doing, but yet people that want to stick with what they've always believed. Well, my mom believed it, you know, and my daddy believed it, and we just don't believe in that. And now what about, well, well, well who do we pray to? Jesus. Because in, in, in the book of Colossians, don't it tell us in the book of Colossians that all of them are in Jesus? Come on now. We can't but speak the thing we heard from who? Not from man. They didn't hear this from man. They heard this from God. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding nothing how they might punish them, wanted to punish them for teaching the truth because of the people, for all men glorified. Now, look, the people would have got mad because the people said, but they did heal him. God left solid evidence, solid evidence that these men were called by him. But when people are jealous, they're afraid of losing their little following. Uh, they don't want to be proven wrong. Then they want to persecute, threaten. And a lot of times they won't help people that are uh, preaching the truth. That's really preaching the truth. Because you got the name of a star that don't mean you're teaching the truth. Now, listen, listen to this verse 22. Said, For the man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was shown. He didn't get a young person. He got a person that had been like that for a long, 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 long time. Wow. Isn't that something? A long time. He had given it to them. I think I went over somewhere else. I don't know where I'm going now. I've lost myself. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, what was the other scriptures I gave you? Because I think I went <laughs> far beyond where I wanted to go here. But let's go to, because um, I might be teaching next week lesson. You know me. Um, let's look at Exodus 13, 17. Let's see. We did ask three. Let's do Romans 8, 12 through 17. I have so much I'd be wanting to say, y'all. I wish that I had even more time to really get into the uh, scriptures. Are there any, uh, everybody have an understanding? Then make sure you make a note of what you would like to ask a question about later. So where are we now? Romans, was, huh? Romans, verse 12. Yeah. All right. Now, now look at, uh, let's look at 11, verse 11. But, if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, we're talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwelleth in you. So you know you're dead as long as you're in sin. And then when you come to the revelation knowledge of who God is, then that spirit, he gonna quicken this mortal body. We're in our mortal body now. The, and it's quickened by the spirit that's in us, which is the Holy Ghost, all right? But you got to get it, and you got to know you have it. Don't let people trick you by saying you don't have to speak in tongues. You can't find me no scripture in the Bible that says you don't have to. There's no scripture to say that. All the scriptures point to this is the sign. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. That means if you're still continuing in sin and living after the flesh, you, we are not, we're not debtors. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That may go to hell. If you continue to follow the desires, longings, struggles you're having with your fleshly mind, the things you're thinking, being stubborn, don't want to listen about it. You got to always be corrected and you ignore that. If you got more than one person telling you the same thing about yourself, it's true. No need of walking away from it. It is true. Even, and no matter how ugly it is, and you don't want to see the ugliness, you got to see the ugliness so that God can move it. Because if you don't have um, sight on, uh, of what kind of spirit you have, 
then the spirit of God cannot move. All right? That's got to die. Because to live after the flesh, look, look at here. Uh, therefore, I'm sorry, brother, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify, and I believe mortify, uh, uh, when uh, Sister Brooks get that, uh, what mortify mean? Mortify the deeds. These are actions and things that you have been doing all your life and doing. It's not right. You can laugh at yourself all you want to, but it's not funny. If you uh, let the deeds of the body, look here. If you kill it, I believe that's what mortify me. You will live. But you can't live unto God and still be continuing in the flesh. What do mortify me? Do Sister Brooks have it? Yes, ma'am. All right, can you read it, please? Yes, ma'am. To subject to severe and vexing embarrassment, to subdue or deaden, especially by abstinence or self-inflicted pain or discomfort. All right, so wait, I'll stop right there. So abstinence and self-inflicted pain, the thing that you have been used to doing all your life, it is painful for you to stop. It's going to be a struggle. And so therefore you have to, that flesh got to be, uh, it, it becomes uncomfortable. You can tell when it's something that God don't want you to do, it becomes uncomfortable. You say, I know I should stop, but I don't stop. Why don't you stop? That means it may be painful for you to do what needs to be done in order for you to live, but yet the Bible expects that you do it. He expects that you do it. When it says mortify, or kill, get control, let, don't let that thing control you anymore, right? Uh, like, so when you like, when you go into uh, Galatians um, chapter six, and I might want chapter eight, but chapter six and eight talks about those different things. And I wish I had more time, but in those things, you can't continue in sin and have grace at the same time. It says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The Bible says no. And we got people walking around here, fornicating, cussing, drinking, doing the same thing they've been doing and say they're Christian. And are you under grace? You're not covered by grace. Grace covers and gives you the power to do the things that may seem impossible of the flesh, but yet by that power you are able to overcome which means that God gives you he gives you assistance he gives you that strength you need to do what you've been asked to do you can't sin and be saved at the same time you cannot do that all right all right so did we read did I finish reading that or did we need to have some more all right, for as many as are led by the Spirit. Now we know that uh, the Spirit, the Word, according to 1 John chapter 5, they're all one. When you are led by the Spirit of God, then you become the sons of God. You're not letting your flesh lead you anymore. If you still see people talking, telling you stuff about yourself that they said when you were younger, do you know you have not defeated it yet? I want everybody to listen to me. Don't let the devil blind you today. If you feel something in your heart and you feel that twinge or whatever, you know it's true, that from the time you was a child, people still telling you those attributes that you've had, you need to overcome. That means you haven't made it yet. That means you're not there yet. Uh, it ain't about your personal opinion. It's about do you really want to go to heaven? That's what it's all about. And of course, you're going to be uncomfortable. Because when the word comes against that flesh, it makes it uncomfortable and painful. Because then you, you got to acknowledge that you're not as close to God as you think you are. For 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Uh-uh. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, or Father, Father. The spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may all be also glorified together. So that is what the, what the Bible is telling you. And these are some things that people don't readily teach anymore. And so I think I finished with that, right? All right. So uh, our next scripture, was it in Romans? Or uh, 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 did I call Exodus? Whichever one I call first, pull it up. And then I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm moving along pretty fast here. So that's good. All right, here we are in Exodus, chapter 13, verse 17 through 22. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, now watch this, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. See, the way of the land of the Philistines was much closer and much easier, even though they had to face opposition. But that ain't the way God wanted to take you. Want, you want to be easy for you. I want to get saved. I want to have to suffer. I want to face persecution. I want people to talk about me. I want to, look, I can get to the promised land an uh, easier way. There is no easier way. Going uh, through the desert, going through the rough places is what prepares us for the promised land. If everything will remain easy, see, that's how God, that's how people weed it out. You know, a whole lot of people left Egypt, Egypt for the promised land, but they didn't make it to the promised land. And that's what happens in our spiritual world. See, uh, uh, when, when, when God, when God does something, he does it for our benefit. Come number one, God wants to lead us. He wants to lead us. And if everything is easy for you, you are being proven by God if you really love him. A lot of people started out like they did, the children of Israel, and they left Egypt. But when you think about those things you left behind, you're turning back. You're turning back. You you shouldn't think, but it was easy out there. This is rough, and I don't know if I can make it. And, oh my God, I got here and I ain't have no. They said water. You say I ain't got no hood. I ain't got no drink. I don't have this. I don't have that. Why? Because God wants you to know that He can be your all in all, and He can fulfill all your needs. That's why. And those things that may bother some people don't bother others. So it don't make you super spiritual because you, you have overcome that one thing, but another person may be having that struggle going through that wilderness. Uh, the illustration of Jesus and the devil, when he came up by that water being baptized and, and the dove, which represents the Holy Ghost, then he went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And that's why you have to have your wilderness experience because you, you are led and, and the enemy comes in your mind and gives you all the excuses why you can do what God said you can't do. If you read about Adam and Eve, everything he quoted to her went totally against what God said. He said, don't eat from that tree. He said, you can eat though. Nothing wrong with eating that. See, if you eat that, you'll be like God. That's how the devil talks to you. And saying, you can still go to heaven. You know, God's not going to do anything. Nothing's going to happen to you. She said, but if we eat it, Eve said, we're going to die. Oh, you're not going to die. He was lying. He wasn't telling the truth. No, she didn't die physically, but her relationship with God was severed. It was it was gone. And, and she didn't have that same feeling, that hunger, that happiness, the joy, because God was doing, giving her everything she needed. She chose to listen to the enemy. And so you got uh, spirits operating there. You got your flesh and you got the spirit and, and, it, and, and they war against each other. So the spirit comes in to give you and empower you. That's what grace do to crucify or continually kill that flesh, that part of yourself. That's the devil, but you don't recognize his voice. If his voice was easily 
recognize then a lot of people wouldn't go in the error of their ways the way they're doing now. They're continuing in errors and, and they know they see it, but they walk away from the word and forget what they saw. You got your pressure to be the Lord. I don't want to be in that category anymore. So then we get, yeah, we pass, t- uh, we're in Exodus 17 through 22. Okay, I have now. But God led the people about. Now watch this at verse 18. Through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children uh, of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. So he took them the long way through the hard way, right? (laughs) He said up here, uh, 17, and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them through the way of the land of the Philistines, some people say Philistines, I pronounce it, although that was near. He didn't do that. He didn't lead them through it. He led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was closer and better. For God said, let's pre-adventure why? The people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt, which means he wanted to take them another way because they would have surely backslid and and then and and backslide, go back to Egypt. And I I will always say that I ain't going back to Egypt. That's why where I get that phrase from, not going back. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness. Now, 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 that wilderness journey will teach them more. And give them bits at a time. Whereas if everything come upon you, you may die in your journey. So God in all his wisdom knew that. So it says, so when when he led them through the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Eden and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him and he straightly sworn the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you. And ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. So I make sure they took the journey from uh, Succoth uh, and encamped in Ethan, the land uh, in the edge of the wilderness. That's where they camped. Now it was on the edge. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud. That means he's watching out for us. He's going before us. He knows what we got to face. He already knows. But he leads us by day and by night. And guess what he did? He went by day in a pillar of the cloud to lead them the way and by night in the pillar of fire to give them light. So you got your nights and you got your day. You got your trial that's overwhelming. And then you got some that's not so hard. All right? And uh, let, let me see. Uh, Lord have mercy. Verse, I suppose I'm going to go to, uh, yeah, 22. He, looked not a, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of the fire by night from before the people. So they need the pillar of the cloud to lead them in the way. And that's what the power of the Holy Ghost does. And by night in a pillar of fire, even though to give them light. When you get in dark places, right? You give them light to go by day and night. So those were both lights for both periods of time uh, that you may have to go through. This lesson is really awesome. I wish I had, um, uh, think about some of the things you've gone through being saved and it almost, you just say, oh my God. You were so, so, so perplexed and so distressed, but yet God brought you through. You're still here. But some of you in the, are in those places right now where you just don't have that desire to commune with God. And that's when you're in a dangerous place because you've got to really talk to God. Every day I have to talk to God. Um, uh, I had to, sometimes I say things that God had me call people and say, no, God, I just did it yesterday. So for some of you that say, but I haven't had to do it yet. Uh-uh, you're the one that really need to pray because you are blinded to the fact that you may not be right all the time in your, you know, Sometimes God will have compassion where we won't. 
we're taking a wilderness journey where we're learning to hear his voice because you're going to have to be presented with two voices. And that flesh is trying to rise up and overtake and tell you the wrong thing. Some of you are looking at me right now and you still, you know why you can't read the word? Because you're disconnected from God. I know there's something y'all don't want to hear, but you're disconnected. You got to get reconnected. That's why you need to get into the word. It doesn't matter uh, how good you can speak or cannot speak. But it matters that you reestablish your relationship with God while you're on this tedious journey. Huh? And allow God to show you, manifest himself to you in your journey. That's what God does. Some of y'all got spirits. You got to shake off praise. Tell God to help you break that. Because you're still in bondage to some of your thoughts and your feelings and what you feel you can do. I think I did. Uh, did I? Let's do Romans chapter 3, 1 through 10. And then I'm going to have to stop. Oh, my God. It was so much I, I, I wanted to do. But you're in the wilderness. If God's going to lead you, you got to trust him, not yourself. It may be, you may be in situations you do not understand, but you got to allow God uh, to do that. So now this is what we were talking about at the beginning of the lesson. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple of the hour, uh, at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carrying whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an arm. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something. Now I want y'all to get something out of this. Then Peter says, silver and gold have I none. Now that meant I don't have a lot of money. Sometimes we don't have those natural things to give a person at that moment. You know, sometimes you just don't have it. At one season in your life, you may have it. And you have every intention to carry things through. And I believe sometimes God block us because he wants some people to go through. You know, we can help everybody. We won't let nobody go through. But I want everybody to think, but just because a person gets to a season in their life where they can't fulfill what they desire to do, don't mean they stop desiring to do it. But God will cause a block because he wants you to learn how to trust him in your own wilderness journey. It's not theirs, it's yours. Because if you keep having them, they won't be able to see what God can do it. They got to see him in the storm. They got to see him as the deliverer, not you. See, but such as I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he told me, rise up and walk. Okay, I don't have all this other stuff to give you, but I got something that's more precious than that. I, I, I got something uh, that you've been wanting all your life. And now this is about to be your day of deliverance. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, which means he was totally crippled and weak. But as soon as he touched him, and he leaped up, leaping up, stood and walked. That means he couldn't walk, he couldn't stand. And he entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. That's what people do when they get that true deliverance. They can't help but give God some praise. Well, I wonder about people that come to the church and even in this space, and they really don't feel that praise. They clap because we tell them to clap. You know, they may speak in tongues to get into that because they hear others doing it. But when you're alone, do you do that? Or do you need a crowd to display yourself? Like the Lord talked about the hypocrites and all that. They want to be seen in the crowd. You can only uh, display love toward God or praise uh, when you are seen by other people doing so. And all the people saw him. God would do a miracle where everybody would have to believe. They said, but I've been knowing him all this life. That's got to be God. When God do something, everybody has to say, oh, my God. Uh, we've been watching this man sit here for years. And now he's in the church, been sitting outside the church. 
All these supposed to have been powerful people passed right by him, couldn't do nothing for him, but God knew the time and the place. God already had it set in time, the place of his deliverance, right? And they all knew that it was he that sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon, greatly wondering. The man wasn't ashamed of the person that the, that the God used to deliver. He, he wasn't ashamed. But in, in the front of all the people, he stood with them. And that was his testimony that God did it through these men. All right. Now here's Peter's answer, and then we're going to go. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate. When he was determined to let him go. See that? See that? You, you the one. But she denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God had raised from the dead. Now that was that body. That was that fleshly body. That was the lamb. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom ye see and know. If you don't believe in the power of that name, if you don't have faith in the name of Jesus, that he's the one that can make you whole and he's the one that can deliver you. He's the one that can give you soundness, whether mentally, bone-wise, muscle-wise, whatever. Because God created us, he can also uh, uh, make new creatures out of us. And now, brethren, I want not, I want that, uh, through ignorance that meant you did it. Now, whatever y'all did, you, you didn't know what you were doing, as did also your rules. You've been ignorant, and so you don't know. Some people could be in church and still be ignorant and don't know. That's what ignorant means. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets, now we're talking about the word, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing should come from the prince, presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He spoke of the coming of Christ. He, he spoke of the Lamb of God. He's the one that takes away the sins of the world. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. He was out of the city of David. Right? Like unto me. Now listen. Him shall ye hear in all things. Whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. And, and so as you go on, he said, you are the children of the prophet. It's talking about Judah, Judah Jews. That's why he chose him out of people. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers. And here's who he named, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his inheritance, from his sin. This was prophesied. And he did send the lamb. Jesus was very much man, but he was also God. Envelope, robed in flesh. He came down to dwell among us. God bless you.
I wish I had time to really teach this the way I wanted to, but I didn't want to just zip through a lesson without people having an understanding of the workings of the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's why there are many more scriptures that we can get into that will begin to connect the dots for us concerning salvation. If God, according to Malachi, then come in and, 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 and enter into this temple, which is this body, this would not be, we wouldn't be where we are today, privileged for him to have shed the final blood sacrifice for us that we might be saved from the penalty of death, which is hell. We're saved from the penalty. That's the final death. Um, and then uh, some of our Bible studies I can talk about, but the Bible points that out. It tells you death and hell are going to deliver up the dead that are in them. And then you will be cast into the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone. So one incentive for those that really want to just really hear God, I, I do feel God, because the Bible said, <laughs> let you know that fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. Better be, you better be afraid. Because he will allow you to die. He will strike you. He will kill you. Because you're not, you're not a part of him. You are part of the enemy. You understand? God made that perfectly clear. He threw Adam and Eve out of the garden because they no longer were a part. Once they sinned, they were no, no more a part or had that intimacy with God as they did before they listened to the false teaching of Satan, which caused them to lose their place where God provided everything for them. And they didn't even have to work. It didn't even have to rain. A mist went up from the ground. That's in the Bible. And water all the vegetation. Once they did that, man from then on had to slave work to survive. But when God is providing, whatever you lack, God will give you what he needs. God bless you, everybody. I'm so glad that you came on to join us this morning. I hope you gained something. And I'm going to say this uh, myself. If I don't have any questions from you, I assume that you understand everything that was talk. But I would like to emphasize uh, the need for you to ask questions. Do it. You're not, you need to see if it is so. Whatever you're hearing today,